the Drachenfels. The castled crag of Drachenfels frowns o'er the wide and winding Rhine, whose breast of waters broadly swells between the banks which bear the vine, and hills all rich with blossomed trees, and fields which promise corn and wine, and scattered cities crowning these, whose far white walls along the shine, have strewed a scene which I should see, with double joy wert thou with me. And peasant girls with deep blue eyes, and hands which offer early flowers, walk smiling o'er this paradise. Above the frequent feudal towers, through green leaves lift their walls array, and many rock which steeply lowers, and noble arch in proud decay, look o'er this vale of vintage bowers. But one thing want these banks of Rhine, thy gentle hand to clasp in mine. I send the lilies given to me, though long before thy hand they touch, I know that they must withered be, but yet reject them not as such. For I have cherished them as dear, because they yet may meet thine eye, and guide thy soul to mine even here, when thou beholdst them drooping nigh, and knowest them gathered by the Rhine, and offered from my heart to thine. The river nobly foams and flows, the charm of this enchanted ground, and all its thousand turns disclose some fresher beauty varying round. The haughtiest breast its wish might bound, through life to dwell delighted here, nor could on earth a spot be found to nature and to me so dear, could thy dear eyes in following mine still sweeten more these banks of Rhine. Nature the Consoler Is it not better, then, to be alone, and love earth only for its earthly sake, by the blue rushing of the arrowy Rhone, or pure bosom of its nursing lake? which feeds as a mother who doth make a fair but froward infant her own care, kissing its cries away as these awake. Is it not better thus our lives to wear, than join the crushing crowd, doomed to inflict or bear? I live not in myself, but I become portion of that around me, and to me high mountains are a feeling, but the hum of human cities torture. I can see nothing to loathe in nature, save to be a link reluctant in fleshly chain, classed among creatures, when the soul can flee, and with the sky, the peak, the heaving plain of ocean, or the stars, mingle, and not in vain. And thus I am absorbed, and this is life. I look upon the people desert past as on a place of agony and strife, where for some sin to sorrow I was cast, to act and suffer, but remount at last with a fresh pinion, which I feel to spring, though young, yet waxing vigorous, as the blast which it would cope with on delighted wing, spurning the clay-cold bonds which round our being cling. But when at length the mind shall be all free from what it hates in this degraded form, reft of its carnal life, save what shall be existent happier in the fly and worm, when elements to elements conform, and dust is as it should be, Shall I not feel all I see, less dazzling, but more warm, the bodiless thought, the spirit of each spot, of which even now I share at times the immortal lot? Are not the mountains, waves, and skies a part of me and of my soul as I of them? Is not the love of these deep in my heart with a pure passion? Should I not condemn all objects if compared with these, and stem a tide of suffering, rather than forego such feelings for the hard and worldly phlegm of those whose eyes are only turned below, gazing upon the ground, thoughts which dare not glow? The Colosseum And here the buzz of eager nations ran, in murmured pity or loud roared applause, as man was slaughtered by his fellow man. And wherefore slaughtered? Wherefore but because such were the bloody circus's genial laws, and the imperial pleasure? Wherefore not? What matters where we fall to fill the moors of worms, on battle plains or listed spot? Both are but theatres where the chief actors rot. I see before me the gladiator lie, he leans upon his hand, his manly brow consents to death, 
but conquers agony, and his drooped head sinks gradually low, and through his side the last drops ebbing slow from the red gash fall heavy one by one, like the first of a thunder shower, and now the arena swims around him. He is gone, ere ceased the inhuman shout which hailed the wretch who won. He heard it, but he heeded not. His eyes were with his heart, and that was far away. He recked not of the life he lost nor prize, but where his rude hut by the Danube lay. There were his young barbarians all at play. There was their Dacian mother, he their sire, butchered to make a Roman holiday. All this rushed with his blood. Shall he expire and unavenged? Arise, ye Goths, and glut your ire. But here the murder breathed her bloody steam, and here where buzzing nations choked the ways, and roared or murmured like a mountain stream dashing or winding as its torrent strays, here where the Roman millions blame or praise was death or life the playthings of a crowd, my voice sounds much, and fall the stars' faint rays on the arena void, seats crushed, walls bowed, and galleries where my steps seem echoes strangely loud. A ruin. Yet what ruin? From its mass, walls, palaces, half cities have been reared. Yet off the enormous skeleton ye pass, and marvel where the spoil could have appeared. Hath it indeed been plundered or but cleared? Alas, develop, opens the decay when the colossal fabric's form is neared. It will not bear the brightness of the day, which streams too much on all years man hath rift away. But when the rising moon begins to climb its topmost arch and gently pauses there, when the stars twinkle through the loops of time, and the low night breeze waves along the air the garland frist which the grey walls wear, like laurels on the bald first Caesar's head, when the light shines serene but doth not glare, then in this magic circle raise the dead. Heroes have trod this spot, tis on their dust ye tread. While stands the Colosseum, Rome shall stand. When falls the Colosseum, Rome shall fall. And when Rome falls, the world. From our own land thus spake the pilgrims o'er this mighty wall in Saxon times, which we are wont to call ancient. And these three mortal things are still on their foundations and unaltered all. Rome and her ruin past redemption's skill. The world the same wide den of thieves, or what ye will. Alp and Francesca Still by the shore Alp mutely mused, and wooed the freshness night diffused. There shrinks no ebb in that tideless sea, which changeless rolls eternally. So that whilst of waves, in their angriest mood, scarce break on the bounds of the land for a rood, and the powerless moon beholds them flow, heedless if she come or go. Calm or high, in main or bay, on their course she hath no sway. The rock, unworn, its base doth bear, and looks o'er the surf, but it comes not there. And the fringe of the foam may be seen below, on the line that it left long ages ago, a smooth short space of yellow sand between it and the greener land. He wandered on, along the beach, to within the range of a carbine's reach of the leaguered wall, but they saw him not, or how could he escape from the hostile shot? Did traitors lurk in the Christian's hold? Were their hands grown stiff, or their hearts waxed cold? I know not, in sooth, but from yonder wall there flashed no fire, and there hissed no ball, though he stood beneath the bastion's frown that flanked the seaward gate of the town. Though he heard the sound, and could almost tell, the sullen words of the sentinel, as his measured step on the stone below clanked as he paced it to and fro, and he saw the lean dogs beneath the wall hold o'er their dead their carnival, gorging and growling o'er carcass and limb. They were too busy to bark at him. From a tartar's skull they had stripped the flesh, as ye peel the fig when its fruit is fresh, and their white tusks crunched o'er the whiter skull as it slipped through their jaws when their edge grew dull as they lazily mumbled the bones of the dead, when they scarce could rise from the spot where they fed. So well had they broken a lingering fast with those who had fallen for the night's repast, and Alp knew 
by the turbans that rolled on the sand, the foremost of these were the best of his band. Crimson and green were the shawls of their wear, and each scalp had a single long tuft of hair, all the rest was shaven and bare. The scalps were in the wild dog's moor, their hair was tangled around his jaw. But close by the shore on the edge of the gulf, there sat a vulture flapping a wolf, who had stolen from the hills, but kept away, scared by the dogs from the human prey. But he seized on his share of a steed that lay, picked by the birds on the sands of the bay. Alp turned him from the sickening sight, never had shaken his nerves in fight. But he better could brook to behold the dying, deep in the tide of their warm blood lying, scorched with the death-thirst and writhing in vain, than the perishing dead who are past all pain. There is something of pride in the perilous hour, whate'er be the shape in which death may lower. For fame is there to say who bleeds, and honour's eye on daring deeds. But when all is past, it is humbling to tread o'er the weltering field of the tombless dead, and see worms of the earth and fowls of the air, beasts of the forest, all gathering there, all regarding man as their prey, all rejoicing in his decay. There is a temple in ruin stands, fashioned by long-forgotten hands. Two or three columns, and many a stone, marble and granite with grass o'ergrown. Out upon time, will leave no more of the things to come than the things before. Out upon time, who forever will leave but enough of the past for the future to grieve, o'er that which hath been, and o'er that which must be. What we have seen, our sons shall see. Remnants of things that have passed away, fragments of stone, reared by creatures of clay. He sat him down at a pillar's base, and passed his hand athwart his face. Like one in a dreary musing mood, declining was his attitude. His head was drooping on his breast, fevered, throbbing, and oppressed. And o'er his brow, so downward bent, oft his beating fingers went, hurriedly, as you may see your own run over the ivory key, ere the measured tone is taken by the chords you would awaken. There he sate all heavily, as he heard the night wind sigh. Was it the wind? through some hollow stone, sent that soft and tender moan. He lifted his head, and he looked on the sea, but it was unrippled as glass may be. He looked on the long grass, it waved not a blade. How was that gentle sound conveyed? He looked to the banners, each flag lay still, so did the leaves on Scytherin's hill, and he felt not a breath come over his cheek. What did that sudden sound bespeak? He turned to the left, is he sure of sight? There sat a lady, youthful and bright. He started up with more of fear than if an armed foe were near. God of my fathers, what is here? Who art thou, and wherefore sent so near a hostile armament? His trembling hands refused to sign the cross he deemed no more divine. He had resumed it in that hour, but conscience wrung away the power. He gazed, he saw, he knew the face of beauty and the form of grace. It was Francesca by his side the maid who might have been his bride. The rose was yet upon her cheek, but mellowed with a tender streak. Where was the play of her soft lips fled? Gone was the smile that enlivened their red. The ocean's calm within their view, beside her eye, had less of blue. But like that cold wave it stood still, and its glance, though clear, was chill. Around her form a thin robe twining, naught concealed her bosom shining. Through the parting of her hair, floating darkly downward there, her rounded arm showed white and bare. And ere yet she made reply, once she raised her hand on high. It was so wan and transparent of hue, you might have seen the moon shine through. I come from my rest to him I love best, that I may be happy and he may be blessed. I have passed the guards, the gate, the wall, sought thee in safety through foes and all. Tis said the lion will turn and flee from a maid in the pride of her purity, and the power on high that can shield the good thus from the tyrant of the wood hath extended his mercy to guard me as well from the hands of the leaguering infidel. I come, and if I come in vain, never, oh never, we meet again. Thou hast done a fearful deed in falling away from thy father's creed. But dash that turban to earth, and sign the sign of the cross, and forever be mine. 
Ring the black drop from thy heart, and tomorrow unites us, no more to part. And where shall a bright couch be spread? In the midst of the dying and the dead? For tomorrow we give to the slaughter and flame the suns and the shrines of the Christian name. None save thou and thine, I've sworn, shall be left upon the morn. But thee will I bear to a lovely spot, where our hands shall be joined and our sorrow forgot. There thou yet shall be my bride, when once again I've quelled the pride of Venice, and her hated race have felt the arm they would debase, scourge with a whip of scorpions those whom vice and envy made my foes. Upon his hand she laid her down. Light was the touch, but it thrilled to the bone, and shot a chilliness to his heart, which fixed him beyond the power to start. Though slight was that grasp so mortal cold, he could not loose him from its hold. But never did clasp of one so dear strike on the pulse with such feeling of fear as those thin fingers, long and white, froze through his blood by their touch that night. The feverish glow of his brow was gone, and his heart sank so still that it felt like stone, as he looked on the face and beheld its hue, so deeply changed from what he knew. Fair but faint, without the ray of mind that made each feature play like sparkling waves on a sunny day. And her motionless lips lay still as death, and her words came forth without her breath, and there rose not a heave or her bosom swell, and there seemed not a pulse in her veins to dwell. Though her eyes shone out, yet the lids were fixed, and the glance that it gave was wild and unmixed with aught of change, as the eyes may seem of the restless who walk in a troubled dream. Like the figures on Arras that gloomily glare, stirred by the breath of the wintry air, so seen by the dying lamp's fitful light, lifeless but lifelike and awful to sight, as they seem through the dimness, about to come down from the shadowy wall where their images frown, fearfully flitting to and fro as the gusts on the tapestry come and go. If not for love of me be given thus much, then for the love of heaven again I say, that turban tear from off thy faithless brow and swear thine injured country's sons to spare, for thou art lost and never shalt see not earth that's past, but heaven or me. If this thou dost accord, Albeit a heavy doom tis thine to meet, that doom shall half absolve thy sin, and mercy's gate may receive thee within. But pause one moment more, and take the curse of him thou didst forsake, and look once more to heaven and see its love for ever shut from thee. There is a light cloud by the moon, tis passing, and will pass full soon. If, by the time its vapory sail hath ceased her shaded orb to veil, Thy heart within thee is not changed. Then God and man are both avenged. Dark will thy doom be, darker still thine immortality of ill. Alp looked to heaven, and saw on high the sign she spake of in the sky. But his heart was swollen, and turned aside by deep, interminable pride. This first false passion of his breast rolled like a torrent o'er the rest. He sue for mercy? He dismayed by wild words of a timid maid? He wronged by Venice vow to save her sons devoted to the grave? No. Though that cloud were thunder's worst, and charged to crush him, let it burst. He looked upon it earnestly, without an accent of reply. He watched it passing. It is flown. Full on his eye the clear moon shone, and thus he spake. Whate'er my fate, I am no changeling, tis too late. The reed in storms may bow and quiver, then rise again. The tree must shiver. What Venice made me, I must be, her foe in all, save love to thee. But thou art safe. Oh, fly with me. He turned, but she is gone. Nothing is there but the column stone. Hath she sunk in the earth or melted in air? He saw not, he knew not, but nothing is there. Greece Slow sinks, more lovely ere his race be run, Along Maria's hills the setting sun. 
not as in northern climes obscurely bright, but one unclouded blaze of living light. O'er oh, the hushed deep the yellow beam he throws, gilds the green wave that trembles as it glows. On old Aegina's rock and Hydra's isle, the god of gladness sheds his parting smile, o'er his own regions lingering, loves to shine, though there his altars are no more divine. Descending fast, the mountain shadows kiss thy glorious gulf, unconquered Salamis. There azure arches through the long expanse, more deeply purpled, meet his mellowing glance, and tenderest tints along their summits driven mark his gay course and own the hues of heaven, till, darkly shaded from the land and deep, behind his Delphian cliff he sinks to sleep. On such an eve his palest beam he cast, when, Athens, here thy wisest looked his last. How watched thy better sons his farewell ray, That closed their murdered sages' latest day? Not yet, not yet. Soul pauses on the hill, The precious hour of parting lingers still. But sad his light to agonizing eyes, And dark the mountains once delightful dies. Gloom o'er the lovely land he seemed to pour, The land where Phoebus never frowned before. But ere he sunk below Scytherin's head, The cup of woe was quaffed. The spirit fled, the soul of him that scorned to fear or fly, Who lived and died as none can live or die. But lo, from high Hymettus to the plain, The queen of night asserts her silent reign. No murky vapour, herald of the storm, Hides her fair face or girds her glowing form. With cornice glimmering as the moonbeams play, There the white column greets her grateful ray and bright around with quivering beams beset, her emblem sparkles o'er the minaret. The groves of olives scattered dark and wide, where meek Cephasus pours his scanty tide, the cypress saddening by the sacred mosque, the gleaming turret of the gay kiosk. And sad and sombre mid the holy calm, near Theseus's fane, yon solitary palm, all tinged with varied hues, arrest the eye, and dull were his that passed them heedless by. Again the Aegean, heard no more afar, Lulls his chafed breast from elemental war. Again his waves in milder tints unfold Their long expanse of sapphire and of gold, Mixed with the shades of many a distant isle That frown where gentler ocean seems to smile. Darkness I had a dream, which was not all a dream. The bright sun was extinguished, and the stars did wander darkling in the eternal space, rayless and pathless, and the icy earth swung blind and blackening in the moonless air. Morn came and went, and came and brought no day, and men forgot their passions in the dread of this their desolation, and all hearts were chilled into a selfish prayer for light, and they did live by watchfires, and the thrones, the palaces of crowned kings, the huts, the habitations of all things which dwell, were burnt for beacons. Cities were consumed, and men were gathered round their blazing homes to look once more into each other's face. Happy were those who dwelt within the eye of the volcanoes and their mountain torch. A fearful hope was all the world contained. Forests were set on fire. But hour by hour they fell and faded, and the crackling trunks extinguished with a crash, and all was black. The brows of men by the despairing light wore an unearthly aspect, as by fits the flashes fell upon them. Some lay down and hid their eyes and wept, and some did rest their chins upon their clenched hands and smiled, and others hurried to and fro, and fed their funeral piles with fuel, and looked up with mad disquietude on the dull sky, the pall of a past world. And then again, with curses, cast them down upon the dust, and gnashed their teeth and howled. The wild birds shrieked, and terrified did flutter on the ground, and flap their useless wings. The wildest brutes came tame and tremulous, and vipers crawled and twined themselves among the multitude, hissing but stingless. They were slain for food and war, which for a moment was no more did glut himself again 
A meal was bought with blood, and each sate sullenly apart, gorging himself in gloom. No love was left. All earth was but one thought, and that was death, immediate and inglorious. And the pang of famine fed upon all entrails. Men died, and their bones were tombless as their flesh. The meagre by the meagre were devoured. Even dogs assailed their masters, all save one, and he was faithful to a corpse, and kept the birds and beasts and famished men at bay till hunger clung them, or the dropping dead lured their lank jaws. Himself sought out no food, but with a piteous and perpetual moan, and a quick desolate cry, licking the hand which answered not with a caress, he died. The crowd was famished by degrees. But two of an enormous city did survive, and they were enemies. They met beside the dying embers of an altar place where had been heaped a mass of holy things for an unholy usage. They raked up, and shivering scraped with their cold skeleton hands the feeble ashes, and their feeble breath blew for a little life and made a flame which was a mockery. Then they lifted up their eyes as it grew lighter, and beheld each other's aspect saw and shrieked and died even of their mutual hideousness they died unknowing who he was upon whose brow famine had written fiend the world was void the populous and the powerful was a lump seasonless herbless treeless manless lifeless a lump of death a chaos of hard clay the rivers lakes and ocean all stood still, and nothing stirred within their silent depths. Ships, sailorless, lay rotting on the sea, and their masts fell down piecemeal. As they dropped, they slept on the abyss without a surge. The waves were dead. The tides were in their grave. The moon, their mistress, had expired before. The winds were withered in the stagnant air, and the clouds perished. Darkness had no need of aid from them. She was the universe. To Mr. Murray For Orford and for Waldegrave You give much more than me you gave, Which is not fairly to behave, my Murray. Because if a live dog, tis said, Be worth a lion fairly spared, A live lord must be worth two dead my Murray. And if, as the opinion goes, verse hath a better sale than prose, certes, I should have more than those, my Murray. But now this sheet is nearly crammed, so if you will, I shan't be shammed, and if you won't, you may be damned, my Murray. Epistle from Mr. Murray to Dr. Polidori Dear Doctor, I have read your play, uh, which is a good one in its way, purges the eyes and moves the bowels and drenches handkerchiefs like towels with tears that in a flux of grief afford hysterical relief to shattered nerves and quickened pulses which your catastrophe convulses. I like your moral and machinery. Your plot, too, has such scope for scenery. Your dialogue is apt and smart. The play's concoction full of art. Your hero raves, your heroine cries. All stab and everybody dies. In short, your tragedy would be the very thing to hear and see. And for a piece of publication, if I decline on this occasion, it is not that I am not sensible to merits in themselves ostensible, but, and I grieve to speak it, plays are drugs, mere drugs, sir, nowadays. I had a heavy loss by Manuel, too lucky if it prove not annual, and Sotheby with his Orestes, which, by the way, the author's best is, has lain so very long on that I despair of all demand. I've advertised, but see my books, or only watch my shopman's looks. Still Ivan, Ina, and such lumber, my back shop glut, my shelves encumber. There's Byron, too, who once did better, has sent me, folded in a letter, a sort of, it's no more a drama than Dani, Ivan, or Kehama. So altered since last year his pen is, I think he's lost his wits at Venice. In short, sir, what with one and t'other, I dare not venture on another. I write in haste, excuse each blunder, 
the coaches through the streets so thunder. My room's so full we've Gifford here, reading MS with Hookham Freer, pronouncing on the nouns and particles of some of our forthcoming articles. The quarterly, ah, sir, if you had but the genius to review, a smart critique upon St. Helena, or if you only would but tell in a short compass what... But, to resume, as I was saying, sir, the room. The room so full of wits and bards, crabs, campbells, croakers, freers and wards, and others, neither bards nor wits. My humble tenement admits all person in the dress of gent, from Mr. Hammond to Dog Dent. A party dines with me today, all clever men who make their way, Crabbe, Malcolm, Hamilton and Chantry, are all partakers of my pantry. They're at this moment in discussion on poor Destal's late dissolution. Her book, they say, was in advance. Pray heaven she tell the truth of France. Thus run our time and tongues away. But to return, sir, to your play. Sorry, sir, but I cannot deal, unless twere acted by O'Neill. My hand's so full, my head's so busy, I'm almost dead and always dizzy. And so, with endless truth and hurry, dear doctor, I am yours, John Murray. The Landed Interest Alas, the country! How shall tongue or pen bewail her now, uncountry gentlemen? The last to bid the cry of warfare cease, the first to make a malady of peace. For what were all these country patriots born? To hunt and vote? and raise the price of corn. But corn, like every mortal thing, must fall. Kings, conquerors, and markets most of all. And must you fall with every ear of grain? Why would you trouble Bonaparte's reign? He was your great trip Ptolemus. His vices destroyed but realms, and still maintained your prices. He amplified to every lord's content the grand agrarian alchemy, high rent. Why did the tyrant stumble on the Tartars and lower wheat to such desponding quarters? Why did you chain him on yon isle so lone? The man was worth much more upon his throne. True, blood and treasure boundlessly were spilt. But what of that? The gall may bear the guilt, but bread was high. The farmer paid his way, and acres told upon the appointed day. But where is now the goodly audit ale? The purse-proud tenant, never known to fail. The farm which never yet was left on hand, the marsh reclaimed to most improving land, the impatient hope of the expiring lease, the doubling rental. What an evil's peace! In vain the prize excites the ploughman's skill, in vain the commons pass their patriot bill. The landed interest, you may understand the phrase much better leaving out the land, the land self-interest groans from shore to shore, for fear that plenty should attain the poor. Up, up again, ye rents, exalt your notes, or else the ministry will lose their votes, and patriotism, so delicately nice, her loaves will lower to the market price. For ah, the loaves and fishes, once so high, are gone, their oven closed, their ocean dry, and naught remains of all the millions spent, excepting to grow moderate and content. They who are not so had their turn, and turn about still flows from fortune's equal urn. Now let their virtue be its own reward, and share the blessing which themselves prepared. See these inglorious Cincinnati swarm, farmers of war, dictators of the farm. Their plowshare was the sword in hireling hands, their fields manured by gore of other lands, safe in their barns, these Sabine tillers sent their brethren out to battle. Why? For rent. Year after year they voted cent per cent. Blood, sweat, and tear-wrung millions. Why? For rent. They roared, they dined, they drank, they swore they meant to die for England. Why then live? For rent. The peace has made one general malcontent of these high-market patriots. War was rent. Their love of country, millions all misspent. How reconcile? By reconciling rent. And will they not repay the treasures lent? No! Down with everything, and up with rent. Their good, ill, health, wealth, joy, or discontent, being, end, aim, religion. Rent, rent, rent! Don Juan, Fragment I would to heaven that I was so much clay as I am blood, bone, marrow, passion, feeling because at least the past were passed away, 
and for the future. But I write this reeling, having got drunk exceedingly today, so that I seem to stand upon the ceiling. I say the future is a serious matter, and so, for God's sake, hock and soda water. Dedication Bob Southey, you're a poet, poet laureate, and representative of all the race. Although tis true that you turned out a Tory at last, yours has lately been a common case. And now, my epic renegade, what are ye at? With all the Lakers in and out of place, a nest of tuneful persons to my eye, like four and twenty blackbirds in a pie. Which pie being opened, they began to sing. This old song and new simile holds good, a dainty dish to set before the king, or regent, who admires such kind of food, and Coleridge, too, has lately taken wing, but like a hawk encumbered with his hood, explaining metaphysics to the nation, I wish he would explain his explanation. You, Bob, are rather insolent, you know, at being disappointed in your wish to supersede all warblers here below, and be the only blackbird in the dish, and then you overstrain yourself or so, and tumble downward like a flying fish gasping on deck, because you soar too high, Bob and fall, for lack of moisture, quite a dry bob. And Wordsworth, in a rather long excursion, I think the quarto holds five hundred pages, has given a sample from the vasty version of his new system to perplex the sages. Tis poetry, at least by his assertion, and may appear so when the dog-star rages, and he who understands it would be able to add a story to the Tower of Babel. You, gentlemen, by dint of long seclusion from better company, have kept your own at Keswick, and through still continued fusion of one another's minds, at last have grown to deem as a most logical conclusion that poesy has wreaths for you alone. There is a narrowness in such a notion, which makes me wish you'd change your lakes for ocean. I would not imitate the petty thought, nor coin myself love to so base a vice, for all the glory your conversion brought, since gold alone should not have been its price. You have your salary. Wast for that you wrought? And Wordsworth has his place in the excise. Your shabby fellows, true, but poets still, and duly seated on the immortal hill. Your bays may hide the baldness of your brows, perhaps some virtuous blushes. Let them go. To you I envy neither fruit nor boughs, and for the fame you would engross below, the field is universal and allows scope to all such as feel the inherent glow. Scott, Rogers, Campbell, Moore, and Crabbe will try against you the question with posterity. For me, who wandering with pedestrian muses contend not with you on the winged steed, I wish your fate may yield ye, when she chooses, the fame you envy and the skill you need. And recollect a poet nothing loses in giving to his brethren their full meed of merit. And complaint of present days is not the certain path to future praise. He that reserves his laurels for posterity, who does not often claim the bright reversion, has generally no great crop to spare it, he being only injured by his own assertion. And although here and there some glorious rarity arise like Titan from the sea's immersion, the major part of such appellants go to God knows where, for no one else can know. Meantime, Sir Laureate, I proceed to dedicate, in honest simple verse, this song to you. And if in flattering strains I do not predicate, tis that I still retain my buff and blue. My politics as yet are all to educate apostasy so fashionable too, to keep one creed's a task grown quite Herculean. Is it not so, my Tory, ultra Julian? Poetical Commandments If ever I should condescend to prose, I'll write poetical commandments, which shall supersede beyond all doubt all those that went before. In these I shall enrich my text with many things that no one knows, and carry precept to the highest pitch, and call the work Longinus o'er a bottle, or every poet 
his own Aristotle. Thou shalt believe in Milton, Dryden, Pope. Thou shalt not set up Wordsworth, Coleridge, Southey, because the first is crazed beyond all hope, the second drunk, the third so quaint and mouthy. With Crabbe it may be difficult to cope, and Campbell's hippocrine is somewhat drowthy. Thou shalt not steal from Samuel Rogers, nor commit flirtation with the muse of Moore. Thou shalt not covet Mr. Sotheby's muse, his Pegasus, nor anything that's his. Thou shalt not bear false witness like the blues. There's one, at least, is very fond of this. Thou shalt not write, in short, but what I choose. This is true criticism, and you may kiss exactly as you please, or not, the rod. But if you don't, I'll lay it on, by God.